Hello, my name is Yasmin Elazab, and I'm an educator at the National Gallery of Canada. I'd like to acknowledge that the National Gallery is located on the unceded and unsurrendered traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. We honor and thank the traditional keepers of this land. Thank you for joining us this evening for Women and Impressionism in Canada on the Trail of Modernity which is presented in conjunction with the exhibition, Canada and Impressionism, New Horizons. La conversation aura lieu en anglais avec l'interprétation simultanée en français. Pour accéder à l'interprétation simultanée, simplement cliquez sur l'icône du globe CDC. Following the discussion, there will be time for an audience Q&A and you'll be able to type your questions in the Q&A box below. I'd like to now introduce our speakers Katerina Atanasova and Anna Hudson. Katerina is Senior Curator of Canadian Art at the National Gallery of Canada, where she has overseen the reinstallation of the Canadian art collection in the Indigenous and Canadian galleries. She has curated award-winning exhibitions of historical and contemporary Canadian art in Canada and abroad, including F.H. Farley, Portraits into the Light, Painting Canada, Tom Thompson and the Group of Seven, James Wilson Maurice, the AK Prakash Collection in Trust to the Nation, and Canada and Impressionism, New Horizons. Anna Hudson is an art historian and curator specializing in 19th and 20th century art in Canada, in addition to modern and contemporary circumpolar Indigenous art and performance. Hudson is a professor of art history and visual culture in the School of the Arts, Media, Performance and Design at York University. She also continues to research and publish in the area of her doctoral dissertation, Art and Social Progress, the Toronto Community of Painters. Please welcome Katerina and Anna. So nice to be here with you, Katerina. And I'm going to start with our first question, which is, what inspired you to curate Canada Impressionism New Horizons? How did, how did the exhibition come to be? Well, Anna, this is a question that I'm asked regularly. So I've given multiple of answers, but I think the shortest answer is, um, as a curator and, and a scholar yourself, you know that uh, art historians often get inspired by the sheer opportunity and the challenge to bring in light moments of history that have not been researched, that have been neglected. And so that is a very similar case with uh, Impressionism and its evolution in Canada. Over the years, uh, the abundance of scholarly interest from all corner corners of the world on Impressionism uh, led me to see and experience that there's hardly a reference to Canada. And so that was a bit of a disappointment uh, in general, but also in Canada, the bulk of the critical attention has always been given to the period of the 1920s, as we know, and the group of seven. So especially for the preparation of the rehanging of the permanent collection of the National Gallery for the sesquicentennial in 2017, um, the colonial period came in to a, re a review with our Indigenous colleagues. And so that glaring omission or that uh, period that ceased to exist from the second half of the 19th century to the 1920 became apparent and it really cried out uh, for a serious need to be re-examined and so that really was my inspiration uh, all in all various factors that brought that into play. Okay. I want to talk to you also about the tour. Um, the, the, the exhibition traveled to three institutions in Europe before finally coming home to Canada. Would you tell us more about the appetite for Canadian art in Germany, Switzerland and France? As I think th this interest in Europe, of Europe might surprise many of us. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. It was a surprise for me too. Uh, we had uh, three countries in three major cities, uh, Munich, Germany, Lausanne, Switzerland and Montpellier in France who uh, uh, agreed to host and enthusiastically embrace the project. So in many ways, they were 
just as much as contributors and collaborators in this project. And the exhibition was created in such a way that it allowed for, um, for the project to evolve and get a different focus in each venue. And of course, each director and curator knew their audiences best, so they knew uh, what would be of interest to their audiences. But what I could say is that in general, uh, having received a critical acclaim and standing ovations in each country, um, there was a common thread. And that common thread was really that sense of yonder and discovery and that um, appeal and, and sort of almost a surprise, moment of surprise as to what impressionism in Canada. Um, and that persisted through and through. Uh, we should be also... Um, reminded that the exhibition suffered uh, as much through the two years of the pandemic as we did, um, almost as a living being um, waving, uh, going through the waves. When, when we opened in Lausanne in uh, February, in January of 2020, the pandemic was not even started, um, didn't even start in Europe. So what we looked at was um, different responses to audiences, some virtual, others in person that really related to the exhibition. But the most important thing was in Munich. And of course, in Munich, the initial concern was how to gain attendance. Um, the the, um, mm. the Kunsthalle really had a, uh, a phenomenal exhibition of the masterpieces of Musée d'Orsay prior to hosting our exhibition. However, attendance was low. And um, so they... Um, they were really concerned that uh, we would go over 50,000. And as you can see from the images of the lineup uh, to attend the exhibition on the day of the opening, that when the, the lines were winding up for blocks and blocks around the main square in Munich, and you were there, Adam, so you remember these precious moments, these palpable experiences for us as Canadians, um, that proved them wrong. And so the exhibition closed with over 108,000 visitors, which was a tremendous success. Um, Germany and Switzerland uh, have never seen Canadian historical art, and uh, France had seen it last in 1927 at uh, the Jus de Pomme when uh, the National Gallery organized this touring exhibition at the time of 1927 of modern art. Um, so you can see from some of the, the, the photographs that I've made or uh, friends of mine during the opening events, uh, the attendance was high and the interest was really um, uh, incredible and enthusiastic. In Switzerland, at the uh, Fondation L'Hermitage, uh, this is an old institution, aristocratic, classical, an institution that has been used to, and, uh, to embrace Impressionism and show many important Impressionist shows. So, of course, the interest was really in the diversity, but also the commonality of the landscape and the winter scenes with Canada. And uh, one of the other surprises for them was the number of women that were uh, included in the exhibition. So we had 10 women uh, out of 36 uh, artists included in the exhibition. And again, various events and educational programs run through uh, for the uh, first couple of months before the, um, the institution was forced to close its doors during the first wave of the pandemic. But the anticipation and the enthusiasm was remarkable. And uh, finally, in France, I think um, throughout my now long career in the art, um, I have had many moments to feel proud, of, but I think I've never had felt such a, um, a tinge of pride and joy for Canada when I saw the eight minute long um, uh, discussion on French national television at the Tevesank uh, on uh, what that show meant uh, for French audiences. And I think uh, every Canadian should feel proud of that moment because France is the country, the origin of Impressionism. And to have four art critics discussing the contributions of Canadian artists and showing images uh, on the morning uh, news program when uh, 60 million people watch was really a tremendous um, success there too. In Ottawa, the exhibition embraces seven different themes, including the representation of women. How, how did you determine the themes? Um, so the, the approach of having a, a mixture of chronological and thematic structure came up very early. I wanted to, as always, um, be a little more fluid to explore, to allow people to really contemplate the works and, and sort of follow in the footsteps of the artists rather than giving them a rigid framework and dictating them how they should see the works. Uh, so themes came up naturally. 
And uh, needless to say for everyone attending our talk, Impressionism is the most universally, universally loved uh, movement. So a lot of people were already familiar with French Impressionism, Impressionism as, as it spread in the United States. Some even knew Australian Impressionism or British. So um, the, the, the main subject in all these themes really remained the foremost obsession with light that all the Impressionist painters had. But the... The, the the sort of hidden message, if you wish, is was the uh, uh, the interaction of humanity with reality, and so that was for me the most important thing. And a lot of the themes are uh, either new or old that have been revived by the impressionists, uh, but they are easily now identifiable with impressionism. And so what happened was the 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 eight teams that tour and seven that now uh, are present in in Ottawa are really um, mirroring a current at the time artistic cultural social and political debates that happened so they were not just an arbitrary subject related themes and and that way allows the audiences who are visiting the exhibition and who are communing with the works of art to really get into the spirit of the time and to feel what the reality of uh, of this artist was the, the the way they moved the way they they saw and perceived whether it was in the countryside or whether it was in the city whether it was at the water's edge or of course the evolution of the portrayal of women and children, what we are about to discuss today. Absolutely, because women artists feature very really prominently in your exhibition. Yeah, so we have um, we have 10 artists in the exhibition and also featured in the catalog and nine um, in, in Ottawa. Uh, if you see a, a, a tiny discrepancy between what went on tour and uh, what is now on view in Ottawa, we should remind our audiences that uh, the reason for that was uh, the long delay of COVID. And obviously uh, most than a, more than a year, the works had to wait uh, for a new opening in Ottawa. And so of course, some of the loans had to be uh, returned. And so this beautiful image of uh, Francis Jones in the conservatory in 1883 was, um, uh, scheduled to arrive in Ottawa, but unfortunately it's not. So uh, I hope uh, whoever decides to visit Halifax would be able to see the the, uh, the painting there in their collection. Uh, however, we're showing it for the reason here to say that as early as 1878, uh, Francis Jones is among the first uh, women to arrive in Paris from that period uh, to study. In, in Paris and as early as 1883, only a few years after her arrival, this magnificent work in the conservatory was accepted at the Salon. And uh, it represents the first Canadian subject uh, as it portrays uh, her sister, Alice, who um, had a fantastic career as a writer, um, sitting in the paternal home in Halifax in the conservatory reading a book. So he here it is, the modern woman educated, independent, and uh, courageous, um, sort of uh, tending to her own world and her own uh, ambitions. That brings us to my next question for you. Uh, when you speak about Paris, what do the paintings of, of the Canadian artists tell us about women's mobility in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and most notably their navigation of modernity? Are these images portraying the new woman and how is that defined? So I specifically uh, wanted to draw attention to um, this work uh, because it is um, rather early from 1885 and um, it's, it's an interesting work by an artist who is not that well known, James McDonald Barnsley, but what we need to understand is that um, Paris, that phenomenon, that cultural capital of the world at that period um, had, one could not think of another place that had more the signs of the bare visible signs of transformation, of modernity, of progress than, uh, than Paris. And as we know, uh, it is for that reason that Ernest Hemingway called the city a movable feast. It was really an irresistible magnet uh, for artists to, uh, to go to Paris and, and, and they went. 
um, particularly Canadians, um, about 15 to 20 years later than the Americans and the Australians and the other groups, but they arrived there in the city in, by the late 1870s. And between the late 1870s and 1914, the outbreak of the First World War, we, we have documents that show that more than 200 students were uh, from Canadian origin were in the city uh, um, attending various uh, public and private uh, uh, schools and studying and furthering their education in the arts. But it wasn't just for the education, that because Paris was also the, the, the magnet that draw artists to see museums and collections, to see exhibitions, to uh, submit and participate in the salon. And also for the uh, ever so growing uh, international community of artists. Uh, so that openness that really um, drive to globalism uh, is really marked by that period. And so no wonder that in the work of James Barnsley, what we see here is urban life at its best, or as the uh, French poet Charles Baudelaire, who is credited of giving that sense of modernity a voice, um, called in to say that it requires a special species, the flaneur, the, the wanderer in the city who can observe life. So, so here it is, Barnsley, the flaneur par excellence as early as 1885. And the two images uh, that are more focused, uh, that are giving a more um, a sort of detail are really focusing on the number of women um, who either individually or in couple with a male um, chaperone uh, were freely walking on the streets and tending toward their daily activities. And so that level of, of detail that Barnsley shows in this work is particularly important for that period. And moving to Peel and Maurice. Yeah. And so further on, we see some artists that, of course, we expect them, be like James Wilson Maurice, the uh, the ultimate flaneur and the urban paint, modern painter and uh, who lived over 35 years in Paris to, to does capture the, the reality in the city. But we also see artists like Paul Peel, who towards the end of his life uh, really goes uh, in out in the open and paints this marvelous uh, um, small size scenes of uh, around the, the uh, Luxembourg gardens and looking for experiences and also searching for light, uh, which eventually is that impressionist um, then uh, to, uh, to feel how light striking different services really changes and, um, and ex changes the atmospheric um, perception and also the, the environment. And so the other thing also that is quite interesting in this uh, small image of Peel is really um, the portrait of, of, of the woman uh, seated there in the, um, in the shade because these images of women and children quite often appear in his work. Beautiful. One of the things that's uh, remarkable about your exhibition are the images of women in the countryside. They abound. Uh, uh, were the artists intentionally seeking out women's ubiquitous yet diverse appearance out of doors? Uh, yes, uh, um, yes and no. I think uh, it was part of their experience of going into the countryside. But again, that theme really evolved simply because um, the countryside became a, a subject of a debate or a disagreement at that period. Uh, is um, some of the critics, uh, for example, Edmund Duranti by the late 1860s already posed the question, what does the countryside want of us? And so is that mm -hmm. a viable modern subject to paint? And as you can see, one of the earliest examples that we have is really um, from the Forest de Fontainebleau, that period, and uh, William Brimner uh, looking at rural environment at rural labor and, and the woman in this very imposing large-scale landscape, um, uh, tending to her daily activities, of course, uh, it's it's painted what, with the tonalities, painted with the concern of light, but yet not impressionistic. So that's closer to the Barbizon school and uh, closer to the experiences of the artists, the first plein air artists in Paris at the time. However, the presence and the portrayal of the woman in that period um, is already evident in the works of uh, Brimner. I'm going to move through uh, a number of paintings, Katarina, and uh, have you talk about them, including uh, this one. 
Uh, yeah, so um, definitely when we look at the countryside, we explore, uh, as I earlier mentioned, each team has a variety of, of, of complex, complex uh, context in which a uh, woman is portrayed. And so images in the garden are quite important because uh, garden had this a very interesting the the space in the garden had this very interesting evolution since uh, medieval times and for example uh the images of virgin mary were always uh, portrayed in the secluded garden or as we know it in latin uh hortus conclusus and uh the impressionists adapted that that um uh, image into their own and so we do see uh fashionably dressed ladies when usually portrayed in secluded gardens, in gardens of calm and reverie, and at the same time, um, being in the public space, being outdoors. And so that was kind of an interesting moment because um, generally the essentialist view of women um, saw women as connected to nature, as representing mm -hmm. nature. So that relationship of women with our identification with flowers, with running water was, was there. However, we know from the, the sources that we always read on women's history that there are certain limitations and women were not allowed to walk freely in the public space and uh, just move about without being chaperoned. And so what is quite interesting that there's this sort of um, dichotomy between the two images. And so the next image that we, we selected by Sophie Pemberton uh, shows another interpretation of the garden as the garden of love, where a girl could be daydreaming, for example, of her object of love. Uh, moving forward, the countryside or the garden could also be seen as a working garden. And so the, here we have a couple of examples, uh, not only Maurice and which is, a, a typical sort of day and uh, the outskirts of Paris uh, in Charenton and um, just an ordinary subject, an ordinary day in which uh, a woman is tending to her laundry. And uh, Helen McNichol, uh, much later work, um, the apple gatherer again in the working garden where the symbolism of the apple as, as sort of the apple of knowledge uh, relates to some images of Mary Cassatt, who was originally um, engaged to paint the women's pavilion at the Chicago Art Expo in 1893, and that consisted of women picking apples. So that subject of uh, a woman as an um, as picking apples in a working garden had its own evolution in the history of Impressionism just as much. And so one example is by Helen McNichol here. Uh, moving forward to then uh, women in the French countryside, of course, the rural labor uh, was quite uh, um, was getting a prominence in the works of the uh, the Canadian artists who traveled widely in the countryside. And one example um, of um, Maurice Cullen's Brittany Washer Women from 1901 that really shows the dignity of rural labor, but also the evolution of how Canadians responded to the countryside, to the French countryside in this case, where figures are drawn to the foreground and very well lit. There's a certain emphasis on that and also a certain evolution in the way or intimacy or, or proximity um, to the beholder and which uh, we see how comfortable now Canadian artists feel traveling across the countryside and, and painting rural subjects. And a little later, um, two of, uh, of a number of great Brimner students who studied with him and of course are not only interested in the countryside but also a sort of redoing it. So now we see that quick swift from the contemporary views of nature uh, to engagement, to engaged observation with life in the countryside. But the whole mm -hmm. subject now is changed. And, and so light is really the primary subject of all these works, although it's a view of a harvest scene. Market. To the market, yeah. <laughs> we didn't have time to uh, really dwell in the exhibition, but um, I wanted to include that image in the conversation because quite often the market scenes were a places of exchange, a place of gathering, a places of social relations, and a lot of the uh, the, the artists, both men and women, in, in the ex in the exhibition were interested, and they often put their easels and painted in that environment. 
The French countryside, of course, and as the seaside that we shall see in a moment, um, was also a site of leisure. And that was a very interesting moment because uh, in May, usually every year, the moment the salon closed and the weather became warmer in, in the city, um, students and teachers and artists alike um, were packing their art supplies and were running to the countryside. And so often the places of leisure were in the environments in Paris and special resort locations or going up north to Normandy and Brittany. And... Um, sites of leisure became very important. And of course, that was the way to see women in public, women dress well, women in the middle class that really moved about freely or in a company of um, a chaperone, a male or a female companion. And so a couple of the detail images here from um, Maurice's uh, Beaufight and Marseille are showing that detail uh, that uh, Often he um, he doesn't focus on, on much of detail of fashion and work. Mm -hmm. It's usually a much swifter in um, marking mostly the uh, uh, the people in the audience. But here he had chosen to really uh, pay attention and uh, really introduce us to individuals who were present in that uh, leisure activity. And we're back to Helen McNichol and, and Ribot. Sorry, you were going to ask something. I was just remarking on the hats, the beautiful hats. Yeah. <laughs> so here we see a, a kind of a variation uh, on the same theme, but also a very easily recognizable impressionist uh, subjects, if you wish, or, uh, or samples that are associated with impressionism, the parasol and that the white dress and that free movement in the countryside, um, but also the picnic, uh, another quite an interesting subject that we have seen in, in a variation by Manet, the Déjeuner Célèbre, and uh, by no means uh, the illusion is there because um, uh, Canadian artists uh, never had, uh, were never agents of social change. So we never see the social commentary that we would expect to see in the French Impressionists. And um, here in Bo, we just uh, simply a variation, a very different variation of the scene painted in Canada of uh, just a family enjoying um, a nice lunch in the summer. That brings us to the, to the seaside. And do these images uh, reveal a new middle class modern concept of the summer holiday? So that is a very interesting question because the concept of the holiday didn't even exist. So it was really introduced at, the, at that period. So, uh, and being by the water uh, edge was another, uh, a sort of an interesting moment because that was. Um, redefined or updated and by the impressionist from the classical symbol of water. So uh, being at the site of purification suddenly became at the site of leisure. And uh, what the impressionist contributed was to create this carefree world and that idea of, of, of modern holiday. And uh, it, it is not necessarily the idea of holiday that we understand today, but what we know is that the artists were really the first one to discover the coast or the writers, um, either or. And so whenever an artist would go and publish something on a particular location, the artist would follow and vice versa. And so what, what we see here is that um, the, the original artists, and I'm talking like, um, for example, Baudin, um, mm. uh, and with, with the famous sort of beach scenes and the, the, the exploration of the uh, northwest coast of France um, that showed up from the 1860s that inspired even Monet to do uh, a similar um, compositions. They talked about the transformation, the sense of discovery, but also the sense of change and transformation of the coast. And there we see fashionable crowds, then we see mobility, then we see accessibility, then we see uh, women and children on the beach and, and all experiences. Then we see the, the activities of leisure, such as the uh, regatta or the sailboat. And, and so all that came into being. And so when the Canadians arrived, so Maurice, for example, was there by 1891. We know one early watercolor that exists. Um, 
uh, painted by him, uh, the coast was already discovered. And the beaches, as to quote one of the, the sources at the time, were looking more like the fashionable summer boulevards <laughs> of Paris. And so you can see this crowded uh, locations. But what Maurice does is he kind of, in his usual approach, empties this crowded spaces and focuses on few figures so that he can really uh, um, have uh, an individual references to it and then uh, creates that fresh, solitary vision, if you wish, on the, in the space. And so the primary focus when we move forward, and we're looking now at um, some images by Clarence Gagnon, um, is that it's now on the relationship between the people there rather than um, in the foreground, rather than on the, the transformation of the beach and the changes mm -hmm. that happen. So, uh, however, middle class, uh, upper class uh, changed uh, uh, the lifestyle as well. Uh, large villas were built, and casinos and boardwalks and, mm -hmm. and all that fashionable lifestyle went there. And so uh, later on, artists like Helen McNichol um, encounter exactly that experience. And that's what projects from, uh, from her paintings as well as Gagnon. Uh, certain, certainly something different here is that the beach is now emptied. Um, in the example, in the Blue Sea, for example, we have this empty center and then the importance on the periphery and, and looking at the sea. So there's a sense of the temporality of the vacation and then the perpetuity of, of nature. Mm. Uh, and in the tent, it's another sort of a very interesting um, evolution uh, of the topic, something that, that she explores and we will see momentarily in her interior scene of being indoors while being outdoors. So we are in the tent, but we know we are outdoors. So we feel that freshness of the air, we feel that um, closeness to the beach and the sun uh, permeating through the canvas of the tent. However, it is a quite intimate indoor scene. And beyond France. And beyond France, so um, this uh, uh, section has many examples. And um, I hope whenever visitors uh, come to Ottawa and see the exhibition, we'll have ability to follow in the footsteps of our Canadian Impressionists in Italy, in Spain, North Africa, and the Caribbean. Uh, we just have two examples here, one that reminds the essential experience of Maurice, the modernist painter in Venice, uh, Venice was such an important location for him. Uh, we know at least of six trips that he had made to Venice. Um, and uh, we also should say, because the National Gallery is very uh, involved with the Venice Biennale that uh, is organized every few years in the Canadian Pavilion, that Maurice was the first officially identifying himself as a Canadian artist that participated in the Venice Biennale in 1903. Um, and the other example from beyond France is from the, um, uh, by Franklin Brunel from the Caribbean um, at Navy. Um, the, the interesting um, experience of Brunel who went on several occasions for a prolonged stays uh, on the islands um, was quite remarkable because he never really intended to see the inhabitants as an exotic attraction. And so that projects in a number of great canvases that he had left so far, we know over 40 examples of um, several of his visits to the island. And this very dignified statuesque almost portrayal of the uh, women who are going about with their daily routine, either waiting for the boats uh, to arrive and bring the catch of the day or selling or buying produce. And so they appear close um, to the painter. They He's familiar with the environment. He's not a tourist. Uh, he lives there for a number of months. And so that really projects of that simple but very powerful narrative that he mm. uses here. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. Okay. I apologize for that. I wanted to ask you or move us to the domestic interiors and, and what prompted these? So the domestic interior was uh, something that we wanted to, but we couldn't really um, explore in depth uh, in the exhibition for the sake of size. Um, and I'm glad we're bringing those two slides because um, they talk about um, the presence of style, the presence of 
taste and what was a la, a la mode at the time, but they're also quite interesting because they're quite different. So Helen McNichol, again, if we re remember her work um, in the tent, it's almost inter this work mm -hmm. of the interior scene is almost interchangeable with the yes. scene of the tent because it is her studio, it's her living space, but it's almost open to the outside world. There's so much light, there's uh, uh, so much freshness. One almost feels the breeze from the curtains and there's movement, there's freedom, there's light. And, and then on the other hand, we see Mary Hester Reed, um, a prominent woman by then married um, to um, another Canadian artist included in the exhibition and a great teacher, uh, George Reed. And uh, this is a, obviously a, a view of their living room, their guest uh, room, broad guest room in the, uh, the in Toronto's house in Witchwood Park. And so that is the traditional Victorian point of view. The room feels very organized, very mm -hmm. safe. There's a sense of security and order. And so if we think of this two completely different world, um, we come to understand that um, taste and fashion had a role to play. And so interiors speak a lot to what the artists obviously felt at the time. And uh, moving on that, uh, we see- the fashion, oh, yeah. Exactly, but also two artists choosing to paint their wives and uh, posing them uh, dressed in a kimono that really clearly points to the uh, tradition of Japanese and the interest in Japanese culture, especially with Brunel's, where it's not just a kimono, but also um, the screen behind her, the fan, the setting, everything that suggests uh, this decor in the house. Um, that it's quite it was quite prominent. In fact, um, this is uh, for Gagnon. This is uh, his uh, first wife, Catherine. And what is quite interesting is that um, there is an archival photograph from their apartment in Paris that shows a very similar interior where there were Japanese screens, there were fans, and there were other objects that were collected. So there, that was their living experience as well. And images of professional women. Women artists, are they statements of purpose? Are they are they declarations of, of, of uh, professionalism? So one, one <coughs> wants to believe that that's the case. And I believe with Florence Carlyle here, it's quite interesting because she picks, um, she portrays her model launching a very uh, traditional uh, scene of a woman launching and resting. Uh, however, in her hand, she holds a copy of the uh, most fashionable, most popular and, and most uh, advantageous at the moment um, magazine called Studio Magazine, which uh, shared a lot of uh, interesting uh, discourses on art and poetry, literature, social studies and so on. And so um, that is a, a suggestion of the new woman living a lifestyle of her choice and feeling independent and educated, uh, able to travel, able to be outside in the open world. And moving on to the next one, just to keep us going here, uh, 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 the Helen uh, the Chintz. Yeah, and similarly, of course, um, that, that, that painting has been really uh, given a, uh, a wonderful attention over the years and uh, in a number of publications as a cover image as well that re it's really become a symbol of the modern woman. And of course, when you think in terms of going back to the interior and the environment in which uh, it was painted, this is a um, in the studio of, in the apartment and of uh, Helen McNichol and Dorothea Sharp with whom she, uh, her partner with whom she shared her life and, and her accommodations of course in uh, London. Uh, and, a, and it shows a quite modern woman um, sitting on a, a very uh, modern sofa, the sheen sofa as we call it. So that was the fashion of the day. It was in vogue, this flower pattern fabric that was used. Um, there are a couple of other, there's another version at least that shows the same model uh, reading uh, intently. So uh, by all means, the representation of women uh, by just before the outbreak of the first war and the works of Helen McNichol suggest this kind of evolution of the modern uh, woman. I want to take you on a big shift now, Katerina, uh, that except for Pierre-Auguste Renoir, the nude was not a popular focus in French Impressionism, yet the nude was a significant focus for several Canadian painters. 
Uh, indeed, and um, it was quite important uh, for us to include the nude. Um, not many impressionist shows in general have included the nude. So we were very um, uh, attentive to select images that would really suggest the different approach that the Canadian artists had to the nude. And um, one obvious difference that um, I'm sure people will agree immediately is that in Europe, uh, when we look at the nudes, and especially in Renoir and Clemente Nana, um, the nudes are almost as, as a pleasure hunt. There's uh, the, the provocative elements, there's the seductive glances, that lustful uh, appearance, and both painter and model, they both appear to be at ease with nudity. And in Canada, uh, we look at images of nudity with an implied dignity and how light defines uh, the human form. They're not staged. They appear to be as per chance encounter. And we're looking at the image of Suzor Kute, for example. The woman is facing, turn her back to us and um, engaged in uh, whether it's, it's bathing, whether it's uh, arranging her hair or whether it's... Uh, uh, reacting to her sorrows uh, and a lot of his images of, of nudes. And I'm sure you would probably have a lot to say in that respect, uh, having worked with Michel Grambois on the, yeah. uh, on the publication on the nude. But that to me was probably one of the most uh, interesting and uh, different approaches to the nude by Canadians. And I think a, a, an excellent observation that you make is that post 1920, uh, the Group of Seven championed the pure landscape Terra Nullius. But this was not the case prior to the First World War. Well, no, because the Impressionists um, were really, um, the Impressionists opened that possibility of looking at reality differently, a modern look at the landscape. And so um, if we look at for the next generations of Canadian modernists, uh, their art really rested on the principle of impressionism. And so the last um, works that we are showing right now that we end the, the exhibition with um, from 1927 and 1930, especially Prudence Hewitt's Portrait of Manor, are now basing on the, the traditions and the, the, the legacy of the impressionists are basing the model in the open, in outdoors, in the landscape. And so, but the prominence of the figure that takes two thirds of almost the whole space of the, the landscape now is quite different, it's quite modern. And so um, if we compare, for example, uh, the work of her teacher, William Brimner, uh, that we saw very much at the beginning uh, with this rigid forms, uh, in the landscape, and then we're seeing this liberated forms uh, by Heward, it is essentially the same subject matter. What we're looking at is a figure in the landscape. Uh, it's really the same subject, but in a very different arrangement. I'm going to uh, move us to right to the end now with two fast-paced last questions for you, Katerina. First one is, what surprised you uh, while working on the exhibition? What did you discover? I think there were many surprises, um, perhaps too many to share in the amount of time we have. But I think if I could summarize a couple of uh, really the most important things that came out of this experience was that the we should not and we cannot look at the Canadian Impressionism through the lens of the French Impressionism because the Canadian Impressionists never abandoned form. They were always true to their academic training and as such, they had a different take, different variant of the local impressionism, if we wish. And also having seen and, and grouped works from the 1880s to about late 1920s, uh, we're talking about 50 years or five decades. Uh, we certainly cannot speak of impressionism being a passing phase in the history of Canadian art. Um, and if we juxtapose that to, let's say, the 13 years of which we know the Group of Seven existed, and even in those 13 years, we don't see them painting together and, and going on similar locations and sharing some similar uh, concerns of art, we can see why Impressionism had a long-lasting effect and even longer-lasting legacy. Um, and, and also, we don't see the Impressionist artists morphing into a unified movement. They remained um, 
more engaged in their individual responses, but they are unified in sharing one common principle, which was the concern of light and how light really travels through atmosphere, through different mediums and how light really affects um, different objects and reality. Um, so in a, in a sense, we accomplished what we set out to accomplish, which was to bring that natural link between the sublime, the picturesque, the sort of mid late, late 19th century um, images of in Canadian art and the 20th century, the 1920s nationalism and nationalist landscape painting. So in that sense, that long lasting legacy of the impressionist and what they left us, the trainings the, the, of, of the next generation of artists, the openness, the, the globalistic approach really uh, in many way um, speaks volume. So that was one of the greatest surprise. And um, if I may um, end up with something that um, became almost uh, a mantra for us. Uh, it, it, it was written by Adam Gopnik, who did the foreword um, to the catalog. And so he rightfully so said that the, the transmission of modern, modernism at the time was a sign, or even the participation in the global impressionism was a sign of a growing cosmopolitanism and mm -hmm. then subsequently brought um, the confident nationalism. So we ought to see that evolution in the works of the Canadian Impressionists. Thank you so much, Katerina, for such a stunning exhibition and for finding so many works in private collections. That's a, a true gift uh, to the public. Never mind the exhibition's richly researched and illustrated catalog. Tell us very quickly before we go to our Q&A, what's next for you? Um, I think there are a number of projects that a number of topics that I've been pursuing for a couple of years now, uh, or more than a couple of years. I think um, my obsession with urban life and culture is very well known to many. <laughs> uh, urban visuality and representation of urban life in Canada has been something that also has been neglected. Um, I'm a bit of a contrarian, so I always pick subjects or topics that are not common. Uh, and and obviously require um, a very extensive research. Uh, and my second uh, interesting topic, hopefully in collaboration with a number of colleagues is on the uh, black model in Canadian art, the history of black model in Canadian art. 